You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Today's episode is brought to you by GetOutOfTheMess.com. Quality attorneys at established law firms for about, I don't know, 20 bucks a month. Those prices are insane. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old, rehashed, personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to, think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani. Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host, personal empowerment coach, I already said Paul Coliani. <laughs> I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your medical treatment. All right. Well, I am back from a uh, month-long I'm going to call it a fun slash recreational slash work trip where I went to New Hampshire and visited my family, uh, my girlfriend and I and her son, and uh, we got to stay with family and stay apart from family. Both were welcome, (laughs) but I say that in the most loving, respectful way because, you know, you spend time with uh, your family and then you need to spend some time with yourselves. I don't know about you, but every time I've gone on vacation, I've not had any time or not much time to myself because there's always someone around. That sounds like a complaint. It's not. It's actually wonderful. I uh, I loved spending time with my mom. I went there every moment I possibly could. I went over to her house. Uh, when we first got there, we stayed with my girlfriend's mom, and that was wonderful, getting to know her and spending time with her, uh, or getting to know her better. I knew her. And uh, then we spent some time with my girlfriend's dad and his wife. And then, of course, I spent time with my mom and my sister and my brother and his girlfriend and kids and all kinds of people. I didn't spend any time with my stepfather. (laughs) Uh, If you've heard this, if you're new to this show, then you're probably thinking, well, why is that funny? Well, it's funny because I If you'd heard me talk about my stepfather for the last uh, three or four years, that's been four years now. So November, this show is four years old. A happy birthday show. Uh, But um, for four years, I've talked about how my stepfather has uh, been the most wonderful personal growth lesson in my life. I think that's a kind way to say it. And, uh, you know, he is an alcoholic. He was abusive, not necessarily toward me, although there was some, uh, but certainly other members of my family. And um, they had to deal with it. My mom had to deal with it. My mom stayed with him for over 40 years until he finally left, and she was grateful. And she went through the process, uh, what I call the abused mind, where the process is once you are away from the abuser, yeah, you might take them back or her. You might take them back and, uh, you know, get back into the relationship, even though all she wanted while she was in the relationship was to be away from him. But, you know, after about a month, month and a half, I asked her, you know, would you ever take him back? And I was joking. <laughs> I was like, so, mom, would you ever take him back? Knowing that she would say, absolutely not. And she, Uh, surprised me. This is before I really learned about the abused mind. And she said, well, you know, maybe. And I was like, what? And, uh, you know, we had to talk about it and I just let it go because I didn't know what to do with that information. Um, But I learned more about emotional abuse, physical abuse, and other types of abuse where the abused victim, the abused mind, develops a traumatic bond to the abuser, uh, not only that, but just all kinds of dependencies on the abuser, and those dependencies become, I don't want to say part of their identity, the victim's identity, but certainly the way they live their life. So I, I began to understand that abuse victims 
live their life differently than a lot of other people. And those dependencies become, um, there's no other way to say it, they become very dependent on those dependencies. Those are uh, security issues like money and safety. I mean, if you leave an abuser, there's a safety issue. If you stay with an abuser, there's also a safety issue. And there's all kinds of um, dependencies and attachments that develop. And, uh, you know, seeing your kids. If I leave, am I ever going to see my kids again? There's all kinds of fears that are in there. So uh, my mom didn't leave uh, mainly because she was afraid. She'd never been alone or without him in her nearly entire adult life, at least since, I don't know, she was 20-something. You know, my my real dad, uh, he, he and my mom divorced when I was one, and then my stepfather stepped in right after that, and that was, has been her life for the last 40 plus years. And now she's not with him anymore. Uh, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. If you've listened to the show while well, you know the story, if you haven't, go check out the rest of the episodes. Absolutely. Because <laughs> it tells all these different stories and personal growth lessons. But uh, anyway, the whole point is that um, her abused mind put her into a state of, put her into a perception, really, a perception that not many people understand. You can look at an abuse victim and go, what the hell is wrong with you? Get out of that situation. Get out, Get away from that person. They are being abusive. They are hurting you. And you're sticking around and you're making excuses and you may even be defending them. I mean... There's all kinds of things that abuse victims say. There's all kinds of things that abuse victims do that uh, certainly I didn't understand for the longest time. And maybe you, if you know someone, uh, you can look at them and start to understand that they have an absolute different perception of reality. They have an absolute different set of values. Like their highest value may just be to stay safe. And that may involve not leaving. So give those people that you know, you know some leniency there. Be there. Be that safe person, that safe uh, place they can go and share and express and vent. And of course, help keep them safe. If they really are with someone who abuses, who victimizes, then you know you, you are there, hopefully, to help them uh, get away. If that's where it needs to go. Uh, I believe it always needs to go that way. I believe that when you're in any type of abuse situation, you get away from the abuse no matter what because you're in harm's way no matter what. So you might as well, I mean, I say that, I don't really mean it. But that's what happens. The belief system of the abuse victim has this belief that I'm going to be hurt, I'm going to be in trouble, I'm going to be in danger if I leave. And... um the reality is you're going to be in danger if you stay. You're going to be hurt if you stay. You will be the victim. I mean, according to that belief system, you'll be the victim either way. So you're better off you know, getting out of that situation. And of course, it gets deeper. Abuse victims might say, I'm afraid that person will kill me or hurt me badly enough that I won't be able to recover. And sometimes that's a very real thing. But that's when you get help. That's when you get people on your side. That's when you get authority figures to come in and protect you. That's when you go to safe houses. That's when you find shelter. And a lot of that is scary. I know it's all scary just to change your life when you've known what you've known. You've been uh, secure in your insecurity, uh, comfortable in your uncomfortableness for so long that making a change like that is just a massive leap of faith and a scary black hole. You have no idea what's on the other side of it. But I look at it this way. Where are you going to be in a year as opposed to where are you going to be in five years as opposed to will you make it if you stay? You know, there is that. I mean, you're either going to get hurt to the point where you have a breakdown, which is a, a healthy thing sometimes. Having that breakdown means you reach the point of no return and you can make decisions now that you may never have made before. Um, or you get injured to the point where you literally can't do anything else but uh, continue suffering. I don't want 
anyone listening that is in any type of abusive situation like that to suffer. I want you to find help, be safe, get help, get out, whatever you need to do. But also friends of abuse victims just understand that it's not cut and dry. I leave. Everything's great now. Sometimes the abusers, uh, they get more stockish. You know, they stalk. Uh, they get more abusive. They find ways to hurt in uh, ways that you could never imagine. They use the kids against them. Uh, they use love against them. They use money against them. There's all kinds of things that can happen, which is why it's scary. And I totally understand that. And I think that subject is very important. But coming back to my mom and how I had that conversation with her a month and a half after he left, and I asked jokingly, would you take him back? And she said, well, maybe. Uh, you know, after a while, after I learned uh, more about abuse and being a victim of abuse and how the mind really shifts, it, it changes your perception, it changes your view of reality. I went back to my mom and talked to her about you know, his absence. And she now says the same thing over and over and over again. I can't believe I didn't leave sooner. I don't know what the F <laughs> I was thinking. Yes, she swore. Uh, she doesn't swear hardly ever. But she said, I don't know what the F I was thinking. I cannot believe I would ever consider taking him back. And then she feels a little bad that she didn't leave earlier. Well, she feels a lot bad. She goes, what was I thinking? Why did I stay with him for so long? I could have been free of him for so long. And, uh, you know, she feels she's beating herself up. She's beating herself up to the point where she thinks she should have had the ability to leave sooner. She should have made that decision. And she can't figure out why she couldn't make that decision. Well, the reason is she had an abused mind. And... Not only that, I mean, abused mind is a loaded term, I understand, but let's put it this way. Anyone who's been in an abuse situation for a long enough period of time is going to develop a different set of beliefs, values, uh, boundaries, and ideas about the world, concepts, and they're just not going to see the world the same as anybody else or anyone that has not been abused. So that was her then, and I conveyed that to her. I was like, Mom... You could never have made that decision where you were. Now, I don't fully believe that's true either. I know she could have, but she was afraid, and no one could have convinced her otherwise. I want anyone listening that is in an abuse situation thinking that you can't make that decision, you can absolutely make that decision, but it's taking that leap of faith that's the scariest. I mean, yes, it's scary to face the abuser, and um, possibly get hurt, but making the decision to leave the abuser, that's facing yourself. That is facing the idea that something could happen. Yes, there can be real threats from the abuser, but I see it as facing the fear of the unknown, facing that black hole, jumping into that black hole, not knowing where it's going to come out, or having a belief system that you absolutely know it's going to be worse if you leave. And I'm here to say that it's going to be bad no matter what. So do the thing that empowers you most. If you leave, how will it look in a year? If you stay, how will it look in a year? How will your life look either way? You know, try that on. Do some future pacing with yourself and see where you end up. Imagine what it will be like staying and imagine what it will be like a year after you leave it's not pleasant i mean both ways can be very scary but i told my mom i said you know you couldn't have made any other decision because who you were then isn't who you are now and he was in your life influencing every decision you were going to make anyway so there's no even if you had the inkling of going you know what I, I, i'm going to leave no matter what as you walked by him, you're going to have uh, triggered memories. You're going to have um, negative associations of what happens when you do the wrong thing, when you say the wrong thing, and you're going, going to jump back into fear mode or wherever you are most of the time because he's in your life. And that fear mode keeps you 
from doing what you need to do to empower you. So when I say, you could never have made that decision, if I had known what I know now, I may have been able to help her, but maybe not. Like if you've ever been an abuse victim or you are in an abusive situation now, I can tell you, hey, you know, that's your own fear and you're facing your own fear. All you need to do is jump into that black hole, do what you can uh, to survive, get some friends, get your network of supporters and uh, just go through it until everything blows over. That's so easy to say. I understand that. At the same time, the first step has to be made. You don't have to do it today. I always say prepare first. I even read something the other day that said, um, okay, when you're ready to leave your abuser, create a super secret private bank account first. That's the first step in your preparation. And I thought, wow, yeah, you do kind of have to become a little deceptive. You have to become a lot deceptive. You have to become very covert. You have to plan your escape. And when you start planning that way, when you walk away, you're not left with nothing. Because if the abuser has control and power over you, they're probably going to use everything they can to keep you in the picture. I want to abuse you and keep you in the picture. It's like, wait, why are you abusing? Because you love me? That doesn't make any sense. They can be very twisted in their logic and their thoughts, and they can say they love you, but that's not the definition of love, not in my book. Love does not include harm. Love does not include hurting in any way. Love includes supporting and nurturing, wanting you to be happy. How can I support your happiness? That's my definition of love, supporting the other person's happiness. What do I need to do to support that path? Because if the person is hurting you, that doesn't really support your happiness. So how can that be love? So if you stay in a relationship where you think you're loved, but the person is hurting you in some way, and then going the extra mile, making you feel bad, making you feel like you are to blame, like you are the cause of them hurting you, or you are the cause of their lying or cheating or deceptions or whatever, that's further abusing you, causing that abused mind, causing you to stay in a situation that is unhealthy. I asked my mom, uh, would you take him back? And a month and a half after the relationship, she said, maybe. I asked her a few weeks later, <laughs> now when we talk about it, she says, hell no, <laughs> I would never in a million years, last man on earth, you know the story, not if he were the last man on earth, not if he gave me a million dollars, never, ever, ever, I can't believe I stayed with him for so long. And I was like, wow, that's a totally different attitude than you had before. Talk about a change of heart. And she goes, I don't know what I was thinking. So uh, that's where my mom stands today. And, uh, you know, my stepfather, I rarely ever see him. He still pokes his head in to family affairs. He still tries to be involved. There is, I don't know, there is some father in him that reaches out to his kids, his daughter and son. He reaches out looking for something. He wants to visit. He wants to move closer. He wants to be closer. And it's so hard to read what's real. It's so hard to understand his perspective. Because I can imagine it's probably lonely when the entire family doesn't want to be around you. I can imagine that. I, I, I have compassion for the guy, even after all I've been through and everything that he's put my family through, which was, I mean, the stories are never ending. I might have to have an interview with my mom someday or something. Just the stories are just endless. And so, you know, nobody wants to be with someone who continues to hurt and harm and embarrass and humiliate, make you feel bad all the time, make you feel bad for being you. When you can't be yourself around someone, you're walking on eggshells. You don't want to interrupt their life by being your authentic self. That's a problem. And so, you know, I do feel bad. I, I mean, just as another human being, I don't want to see anyone lonely or unloved. But he set his life up this way. He systematically 
made every single person that ever supported and loved him want to be as far away from him as possible. He set that up. That's what abusers do. They set up their life so that nobody can love them or help them or support them or even feel bad for them. And it's so strange to feel bad for someone who's hurt so many people that I love, including myself. It's so hard to feel bad, yet I still do. It's because I've I've been built with compassion and empathy and I don't want to see anyone suffer. So it is, it's strange for me to admit that I still feel bad for the guy. I, want, I mean, that's, that's the right thing to do, right? Feeling bad for someone because they're suffering. Yet, uh, how much suffering has he done and how much has he set himself up for this path that he's now on? It, yet, it's, it can still be difficult. So I understand what happens with traumatic bonding. I understand what happens when you are loved and abused at the same time and you equate, I mean, that's what traumatic bonding is. I've talked about it a couple of times. You equate love and pain and they're the same thing. And if you're in pain, if you're being hurt, that must mean that you're, that you're loved and, you're, and important. You're significant. When you feel significant, you feel validated. You feel valid. You feel, I don't know, you feel like you're accepted. Again, you're important. And so we have these basic needs, yet they're uh, provided to us in ways that are harmful and then we grow up with odd perceptions and weird personality quirks and dysfunction after dysfunction and we get into dysfunctional relationships that are toxic and are capable of you know destroying us and getting out of these relationships leaves us as a shell of who we were it's just a non-stop uh, vicious cycle so it is hard to feel bad for the people that abused us but you know, sometimes we do. Some people we feel bad for. We want to see them heal. I would love to see him straighten himself out, figure things out in his life, realize that the reason that nobody wants to be near him is his own doing. Uh, I don't think it'll happen, but it would be nice. But it's not happening now, and I have a feeling that it will never happen. So that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to kind of talk about this in a way where when we look at abuse victims, we think, well, why don't they just, you know, do this? Why don't they just leave? And it's not easy. That's the bottom line. It's not easy. And unless you're in their shoes, you will never understand. And if you are an abuse victim, then you do understand. You could probably fill me in better than I can do it. I've had minor abuse in my life, uh, but I've talked with many clients that have had it. And of course, uh, directly to the members of my family who have had it. And uh, certainly seeing what an abuser is capable of doing and uh, destroying someone's life, uh, literally. I mean, there are abusers that can destroy people's lives, especially if they're children when they're getting abused. And uh, the person who is abused has to grow up and try to figure things out. They need a great support system, and sometimes they don't always have it. So it's important to talk about. It's important to bring it up on a show like this that is designed to empower you. I want you to be empowered. I want you to feel good making decisions for yourself. I want you to be able to trust yourself so that you can just walk outside and go, well, this is what I'm going to do today. And if any fear comes up, you go, ah, you know what? Screw this fear. It holds me back every time. And what am I really afraid of? Because if I stay this way, I'm always in fear. So I might as well do something different. I'm going to do something different today. If you can get there, great. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's safe. You may not be in a safe situation to be able to, do, to say something like that. I'm just saying that there's one way you can stay and there's many ways you can go. So if you don't like what happens if you stay, then consider what happens if you make a different choice. Consider where you can end up if you make a different choice. Because I know that um, from my own experience, I know that uh, staying in a bad situation, it just makes you more resilient and tolerant of bad behavior. And uh, maybe you need to get to the point of intolerant. Maybe you need to get to the point where it's all you can stand and you can't stand anymore. I think there's a quote like that. That's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. And uh, you get to that point, then you make the choice. You take action. 
some of the best results in life come from some of the hardest decisions we have to make. I want you to have the best results. We'll be right back. All right, I want to tell you about uh, getoutofthemess.com. This is something my girlfriend and I use, and uh, she's been using it for like seven or eight years now. And I've had her on the show, and she's talked about how she got, I don't know, hit in the face with a baseball and lost a tooth. And she's had to have multiple surgeries and multiple surgical implants there over the years. And she's had like uh, problems with timeshares from with her ex. She's had problems with uh, custody with her kids. All kinds of issues that have come up in her life. I know she's not the only person that goes through issues like this. Um, I've not had the same number of issues my entire life than she's had in the past 10 years. So uh, she got on a service called Legal Shield, and she has used this service for every time anything came up that she wanted legal advice and even legal representation. Now, she decided to become an independent associate for Legal Shield so that she could tell others about it. And if they purchased the subscription through her, she would make money from the purchase. Because what had been happening is that she was using the service, telling other people about it, and she would just send them free business. <laughs> so she found out there was a program that she can join to make money from people who purchased the subscription through her. So she became an independent associate and she created the website, getoutofthemess.com. And uh, she not only helps people learn if the service is right for them, but she is also someone that you can go to. And if you use the service and wanted to sell it yourself to other people, then you could also make something off the subscriptions that they purchased uh, through you. So if you're interested in either path, you know, getting it for yourself to use it for yourself, or you already have it and you want to share it with others, and then make a commission for every person that subscribes, reach out to Asha. Call her at 678-355-8777, and she'll tell you all about it. She's not there to sell you. She's just there to inform you. And uh, if you like it, great. She'll help you out. And if you don't, at least you're more informed. At least you can go on knowing that it doesn't sound like it's going to work or it does. Either way, give her a call. 678-355-8777. Well, I had someone reach out to me, said uh, that she wants to know about step parents and stepchildren, and um, you know what's the dynamic there. What 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 are my opinions on bringing a step parent into a family, or you know having a step child now that uh, you're in a new family? And I thought, okay, let me start off the show talking about my stepfather, which uh, turned out to be more about abuse and um, the abused mind. Sometimes that happens. I'll think about a topic and it'll kind of branch off. But uh, I did mention my stepfather and I have a somewhat unique situation because there was abuse involved and uh, he hopefully wasn't the type of stepfather that most people would want in their life. But um, I knew nothing else. I was one when my stepfather came into my life. So that was my life. And it was so strange when people would comment about my stepfather and I would just go, huh, what are you talking about? And they would say, well, that's not normal. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, well, okay, I, I didn't know that wasn't, what's normal? I don't get it. Uh, I knew I didn't like being around him. I knew, I, I knew his behavior was not something that was uh, other people liked either, but I just, that was my normal. So this person that uh, reached out and asked, you know, talk about this stuff. I thought it was a good idea just to kind of mention what happens when you bring a step parent into a new family or you have a stepchild or stepchildren. Now, I will say this. I'm going to share this from my perspective and my experience with clients and my family and their family and the dynamic that I've seen 
over and over again. But I'm not a uh, step-parent, step-child expert here. But I, I do know that some specific things happen when a step-child or step-parent is introduced into a family. For example, the uh, letter that I read, I don't know, uh, episode or two or three ago, where a young girl wrote to me, I think she was in her 20s, and said that her mom died, and then several months later, her dad got a new girlfriend. And she did not like this at all. Her and her family, I think, they did not like that he had this new girlfriend. It's too soon, too soon. We don't want a mom replacement. And I, I answered that uh, as well as I could. And, but it made me realize, you know, how invasive a step parent may seem to be. And if you've ever been or are a step parent now, was it invasive? Did you feel like you were invading the child's space? Or were they too young? Or were there other circumstances? I don't know. But when you walk into a situation as a step parent, you're going to have all these eyes looking at you as, I don't know, sort of a replacement. It's going to feel like that. You're, you're replacing mom. You're replacing dad. They may not say those words, but you may feel like you're doing something bad. So the idea that you're stepping in, first of all, I think it's very important to not step in as the replacement. Unless, you know, there's some circumstances, like if you're adopting the, the stepchildren, if you're uh, in a different situation where the mom or the dad has passed away and uh, you can tell the, the kids need some sort of mentor or role model or mom or dad, then you might step in differently. I'm talking about times when a step parent is introduced into a family and the step parent suddenly feels unwelcome or the children resent it. They resent having you there because you're not mom or you're not dad. And then what do you do with that? So my take when it comes to a step parent walking into an established partial family, I say partial because hopefully one of the other parents is not there in that picture anymore, uh, then you have to walk in as more like a friend to the family. This is my opinion. Uh, and again, it's not in every circumstance. If there's different things going on where you do have to walk in as a parent or as a mentor or what else. Uh, but if there's any type of uh, resistance to you being there, then I highly recommend you uh, treat it as you're a friend of the family. That doesn't mean you aren't snuggly and kissy with your new partner, uh, but it does mean that what the kids are used to seeing, their real mom and dad or dad and dad or mom and mom kissing each other, that it's going to take some time to figure out that the new dad or the new mom is a safe person to do that. Because there's a huge attachment to a parent in most cases. Like when um, my dad, my real dad, uh, got married. A nice, very nice woman he got married to. But I met her for the first time when I was like, I don't know, eight or nine. I forget. I was at a hockey game. And my dad's like, hey, Paul, this is, you know, what's her name? Ellen, or I don't want to say her real name. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And I, I didn't think twice about it. It was just a new person that he's hanging out with. Um, and he had been single for a long time, so it didn't really phase me too much. But it was just an odd feeling inside me as a kid looking at this woman that wasn't really my mom and was a woman like a mom that was in my dad's life. It was confusing. But she was very passive with me. She didn't tell me what to do. She didn't like make it hard for me at all. It, it was fine being around her. And then when her and my dad moved in together, I don't even remember if I lived with them or not. I forget. I was going back and forth between my real dad and my stepfather and things were happening in my life at that time. So, so I don't really remember too much. I just remember that I don't have any unpleasant feelings about her uh, because I don't remember her ever being a uh, disciplinarian or any sort of authority with me. Maybe there were times that she was, and I think if you're a young enough child, it's okay if someone sort of takes that authority role. 
But when you get to a certain age, like when uh, when I moved into my girlfriend's place and I met her, when was it, the 13-year-old son at the time, 12 or 13, at that age, it's a lot different. Fortunately, she had been divorced for many, many years, and her and her son talked openly about you know, her having boyfriends when she was dating for many years and just dating different people. And uh, for me to come in, it wasn't a big surprise. Oh, there's another guy in her life, no big deal. And he said, well, I wonder how long he's going to (laughs) last. And I got along with him because I didn't come in as the stepfather. I came in as a friend. I came in and said, hey, what do you need? Hey, you need a ride to the store? Great. I'll help you out. I'll give you a ride to the store. It was never like, we're not going to the store now. It's too late. I actually went above and beyond. I bent over backwards because I knew that I was stepping into his domain. This is his life with his mom. And for me to now break this little circle of comfort that they had, or he had, uh, that it was very intrusive. It was very invasive. It was going to shake things up. Even if I was the nicest guy on the planet and the most wonderful father figure he'd ever had, uh, I knew that I would have uh, this would be shaking things up. So I just came in and still are a friend to him. It is rare that I ever show any discipline toward him because I know that's something his mom has been taking care of for all these years, and I want him to know that I am safe. I'm not here to uh, make his life harder. I will keep him safe. I will make sure he doesn't you know, jump off the roof because it sounds like a fun idea. But I don't want to be seen as the troublemaker that uh, joined the family. Fortunately, he has a real dad that takes care of him and they get along great. And I've met his real dad and we get along fine. So that's not a big issue. So my transition into this family was very easy. Her son looks up to me, I think. He may, I don't know, he may think I'm a dork. And (laughs) his language. But we get along. And that's all I care about is we get along. I'm accepted. He's actually said he likes me. I appreciate that. I told my girlfriend I would take a bullet for him because he is, you know, number one in her life. He is important. And I think that's another thing that you have to think about as a step parent is that the children look up to the real parent as the thing, the thing in their life that they appreciate, adore, want. Typically, this is what happens, that the child looks up to the real parent And that's strong and that's safe. They can always rely on them. And you step into the family as a step parent. I think you have to have a philosophy of, I would do anything for this kid. Not always. That might not be exactly how you feel. This is, like I said, my opinion. This is how I stepped into this family. I'll do anything for this kid because I know my girlfriend would do anything for this kid. I would do anything that my, my girlfriend would do for this kid. Why? Because A, know that if the kid gets hurt, the kid feels bad, that my girlfriend's going to feel bad and that would make me feel bad. Of course, you know, I have compassion and caring for the kid as well. But this is what you look at when you're a step parent. You keep this philosophy in the back of your mind that if the kid's happy, (laughs) then that makes your partner happy, which makes you happy. That trickle up effect or trickle down, however you want to look at it the kid's unhappy, especially if you made them unhappy, then it may not go as well. So I like um, keeping that thought in mind, always knowing that I'm still an outsider in the sense that I am will never replace dad. I'm not here to replace dad. So I think that's a good perspective as a step parent is to go in and say, no, I'm not here to replace your dad. Even if the person that you are, quote, replacing has passed on, you show up as the friend and then you allow the loving and the closeness to emanate from them. And the more the child gives it to you and the more open you stay to that, the more you can give back safely. If you start giving too much too soon, uh, it can be resisted and even resented because that's what they got from their real parent, hopefully in a healthy situation. If they didn't, you can have a multitude of um, different uh, relationships with their parents. Who knows if it was healthy or not, if it was good or not. But I'm just saying, in some situations, you're going to meet resistance if you give them too much love and you want more of their time and you, you know, you're, you're trying to show that you're there 
to give them anything they need, and sometimes that could work against you. So if you're one of these very loving, what can I do for you now, always helping, always maybe even people pleasing, that might be resisted because that, you're not my real mom, you're not my real dad. There's that aspect and I like to keep that in mind and just stay passive enough for them to feel safe enough to share things with me. And then you try to understand where the child is, how close the child wants to be, and that allows you to be close as they are. You know, you're gauging your connection by them connecting with you. So I think these are good things to think about when you're approaching a family as a new step parent, because that can be kind of scary sometimes. But let's look at the perspective of the child. I am a stepchild, and I remember first learning that I was a stepchild and being in this dynamic of having a stepfather that uh, I loved and feared at the same time. So my situation is very different than some others. Maybe not yours, maybe so, I don't know. But uh, having this highly dysfunctional, highly dangerous person around me gave me a whole different concept of what stepfathers are. He was my only, is my only stepfather. I did have a stepmother, like I said, and that for me was uh, a feeling of, okay, this is a family friend. I like, I don't mind this. And she allowed me to grow close and connect with her on my terms. And as a kid, that's what I want you to think about. I mean, I don't know if any kids are listening now, maybe, but um, if you have a stepchild, to be open, to be safe for them to share anything with you. I mean, I'll have, this is funny, my, uh, <laughs> my girlfriend's son will sometimes ask me questions and share things with me that he won't say to his mom. And when she overhears it, when he didn't mean for her to overhear it, she'll say something and then her son will say, well, that's why I didn't tell you and then just get mad. <laughs> so I can tell that I've established some level of safety for him. And I think that's good. I think there's a way to connect with a stepchild that makes you sometimes even more safe than the real parent. I'm not suggesting that you do this. I'm just saying that I've found that because I am more safe in some ways for him, he's not really unsafe, but in some ways he knows he can share things with me and I'm not going to lose it. I'm going to have an even temper on things. I'm going to be very balanced and fair in my thoughts uh, of what he's telling me. So I, he gets that from me. And as a stepchild, most of the time they're looking to feel safe with the person. Because the step-parent walks in, this is unsafe, intrusive, I don't like it, so how can I make it safe? Uh, some stepchildren are like, I just don't ever want to see you. Great, I'll make myself scarce. I'm not saying you actually do it, but you know, if they're in the room, you walk out. Oops, sorry, I'll walk out. Because what will happen is as you, I don't know, I hate to say this, uh, follow their requests, they'll typically reach a point where they can end up trusting you. And when you trust someone, you can connect with them. So from the kid's point of view, from the stepchild's point of view, as long as you can get to a point where you are trusted, uh, especially like if they tell you something and you don't fly off the handle and yell and scream and, or something like that, if you can get to that point where you're trusted and you are actually a safe person to talk to. And they're sharing things with you that they may not even share with their parents. Not that I'm suggesting that's a good idea. I'm just saying, let's just say you have this idea in mind. How can I make it so safe for this kid to share things with me that he wouldn't even tell his own parents? Again, it's not that you want it to be that way. It's just that you want them to feel that way. You want the kid to feel like it's safe to tell you anything. And then if there's, if it's like really major information that they tell you, you can convey it in a way to his mom or dad that uh, takes some of the impact off of the kid. Because when the real mom or dad finds out and they get upset or whatever, uh, then you can go, okay, now <laughs> when you talk to him about this or when you talk to her about this, don't lose it like this because this is why they didn't want to tell you, you know, just Talk about it with me. Let's talk through this so that when you are able to talk about it, you can be calm and rational and sensible 
and really hear all sides of the issue. Because I tell you what, a, a kid may not agree with you most of the time, but they appreciate honesty. They appreciate fairness. So if you're honest and fair almost all the time, and then you would disagree with them, they may not like it, but they know where you're coming from, uh, meaning that you've actually thought about things and really considered them and really give fair answers and aren't just telling them what they need to hear because they're a kid and they don't know better. Does that make sense? It's like if you are a step-parent and you're always calm and fair and rational and you're just trying to make them feel safe uh, sharing things with you, and then when they share some big piece of news that you know could be really, who knows, could be really bad, could be really impactful to the family, and you still don't lose it, and you've been fair and rational this whole time, and then as long as you're continually fair and rational and that safe place, then they're more likely to share bigger news, more impactful information, because that's what kids do. They impact you. <laughs> they get into trouble. They sometimes lie. They sometimes do things that you definitely would not agree with as an adult. But when you look back and you go, oh, well, I was a kid and I did those same things, but, but I never want you to do, do those things. You have to come back to yourself and go, okay, this is a kid. This is what happens. Pushing boundaries, testing limits, trying to figure out the world, what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's not, all kinds of things. And the idea of being a stepkid, stepchild, it can be so difficult, especially when um, there's not enough time between not having a real mom or real dad or real something there that was blood connected that they've been with since they were born. When that part of it is gone or both, sometimes both parents are gone and now you're stepping in, that happens too. But in the vein of uh, stepchildren and stepparents, when one new parent, parent comes in and they act like a parent right away instead of acting like a friend the whole time that can disrupt a lot and the kid's point of view is that person's a jerk I hate them I don't want to be around them everything was great until they came into the picture well how do you make it great you kind of have to let them be in a lot of ways and hopefully they have a strong real parent in the picture that can be the disciplinarian most of the time unless it's a different circumstance like I said but uh, my whole point around this is how can you show up as safe and passive to allow them to connect with you on their terms let them connect with you on their terms because being a stepchild is hard it really is there's already a lot going on in their world um, their parents aren't together anymore that may have rocked their world for a long time. That could last years. Like I remember having uh, two, two fathers at one time. One the stepfather and one a real father. And I went back and forth up and down the East Coast living with my stepfather and my mom. Then going back and living with my real father. And then going back. And at one point, I remember when I was 14, I lost it. I burst out into tears. I told my dad, why can't you just be married to my mom? And I started crying. I was like, why did you ever get a divorce? This is 14 years later because I was feeling the stress of going back and forth. It would have been a lot easier if my mom and dad were together. Absolutely. Not for them. <laughs> it would have been a nightmare for them. But for me as a kid who just wanted to be with mom and with dad at the same time, it was tough. So you got to remember that kids are feeling the stress and the pressure and the strain of not having two parents. At least their real mom and their real dad. And I hate to say real because, you know, that's kind of insulting. <laughs> it's not that you can't be a real mom or a real dad, but their biological mom, their biological dad. When they don't have those two people in their life, that just rocks their world. They they can feel like they're at fault, like they caused it. They can feel like um, they're not important. They can have all these beliefs about themselves that aren't true, but they develop because, well, why would she leave me? Why wouldn't she stay with the family and just, you know, have the same arguments over and over again with dad? Why would she leave us? Why would she do that to us? Does she not love us? Or he, you know, why would he leave us? Why would he say those things that he said? Why doesn't he just come back? All of this is might be repressed in the kid. 
So to have that in their system and not be able to express it, that can build up a lot of uh, repressed emotions, a lot of negativity. It can lead to depression. And if they're not able to express it to someone, which is another reason I, I would love for both parents to be absolutely safe for a child to share things with. I get emails every now and then from kids who tell me that they haven't told their parents something. They're afraid to tell their or they have told their parents something and they the parents lost it and made them feel bad for the, about themselves and now they have no one to talk to. They've literally stopped talking to their parents because when they do tell them something that's, you know, very important to the kid and the parent loses it and makes the kid feel bad or makes the kid feel like they're in trouble or actually gets them in trouble, then they never want to share again. And I think it's vital that you have a relationship with your kid that gives them the ability to tell you anything. Hey, mom, I I tried drugs for the first time. You know what most moms do? What? What? (laughs) You know, they, they lose it. Not most moms, any a lot of parents, any parent, mom, dad, whatever, a lot of them lose it. I told you never to try drugs. As soon as you start down that road, I told you to never blah, blah, blah. They'll never want to share anything with you again. So things like that, uh, coming in as a step parent who doesn't lose it, that calm, rational person that comes in and can be an ear for this person, can also put the step parent in a, a better place. But I do highly recommend that uh, both parents, if there's a two-parent uh, family or even the single parent, take all information as almost fearful sharing. What I mean by that is you've got to look at your child as if they're afraid to share this with you because they know how you are. Imagine that. Your child's afraid to share with you because they know what you'll do. They know what you'll say. Imagine that's in the child's mind. I don't want to share this because I know what he or she's going to say. So if you step into that child's mind and you realize, wow, if I had to tell my parents that, that would be very hard. How about this one? Mom, dad, I'm pregnant. What? (laughs) Like mind blowing right there. But that's what happens. And I knew a girl actually when I was younger. Um, She was about 15, maybe 14. I don't remember. But um, she told her mom because she had no choice. She was pregnant. It was going to show. And her mom, I don't remember her reaction. She didn't tell me her reaction. This was secondhand information. But I do remember um, her saying, well, okay, uh, now that that's happened, we got to take care of it. And they all bonded together and made sure that the uh, new baby had a good home. And they got the father involved, of course, and tried to make everyone take a role in getting this baby into the world. It wasn't, what have you done to this family? How dare you? It wasn't that at all. The kid already knew she was in trouble. The kid already knew that it was not time to have a baby, but yet here they are. So they just handled it because it had already happened. Just like um, when a child comes out, mom, dad, I'm gay. When they come out, What do the parents do? And this is hard stuff because I've heard parents kick their children out of the house because they couldn't handle it. That happens and it's very, very sad. It's very sad when it happens because now the kid has no support system and guess what's going to happen? They're going to turn to other people for their support. They may get involved with drugs. They may get involved in who knows what because the only people that they could feel most safe with just kick them out that's tough just for letting their parents know that they prefer the company of someone that their parents disagree with that's really what it comes down to they prefer the child prefers the company of someone that the parents disagree with so you know i could go on and on and on there's all kinds of things but if you can provide that safe place for your child as a biological parent Imagine the kind of hero you become if you're the step-parent walking into that scene and providing that for the stepchild. Now, I'm not saying the stepchild were ever like you. They're gonna, there are going to be times when stepchildren don't like the new person. You might be that new person, and the stepchild may never like you. And I, I say adopt that too. 
accept that role, accept that world. You know, you bring them home something they, they love to eat, but you know that they don't like you. You can say something like, I know we don't get along. I know I'm the bad guy here, but I got you this. I was thinking about you here. There's no strings attached. I just, I thought about you when I was out. And you walk away. And you keep showing up like that. Hey, you know, I realize we don't get along. Hey, you know, I know you don't like me. I'm the one walking in on this family. And that's not what you wanted. And I totally get it. I'll stay out of your way. And you just keep showing up like that until they acclimate. Until the resistance wears down. Until they realize, hey, you're really honoring my boundaries here. It may never happen. There are children out there that never come to an acceptance of it. I've not seen that myself. Unless the step-parent goes against their resistance. Well, too bad I'm here. You're going to have to deal with it. As soon as they do that, then the, the stepchild may never accept. And that's tough too. It's never too late. <laughs> if you're in that situation, if you're in a family, it's never too late to just start being more of that safe person to be around and accepting their reality, accepting their model of the world. This is how they see the world. Hey, I totally get it. I'm the bad guy here. I'll stay away. I understand. I walk in the room. You're there. No problem. I'll find my own space. I'm not saying it has to do that forever because eventually the kids grow up. Um, but this is sometimes what you do to help uh, increase connection when there are children involved that maybe don't want you there. So I kind of went here and there with that topic, but I hope this helps uh, get a better understanding of my take on stepchildren and step parents and the dynamic that forms and the bonding that can happen and the bonding that sometimes never does. Either way, you accept where the child is and uh, do your best to be there for them, which goes a long way. We'll be right back with some uh, goodbyes and my final words after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank GC Smiles for their review of The Overwhelmed Brain book in Amazon. GC Smiles says it's help for your brain. <laughs> it's a really great book. Why, thank you, GC Smiles. You're a really great person. And thanks for the review. And I'd like to remind you that if you leave a review for The Overwhelmed Brain book in Amazon, I will thank you on the air, too. I'd also like to thank GetOutOfTheMess.com. If you want the power to be able to call an attorney without paying the exorbitant fees just to talk to someone on the phone, call Asha. She'll tell you if Legal Shield is right for you. 678-355-8777. And I want to thank patron members for their support of the show, especially during the month of October 2017. Yes, that was last month uh, as of this taping of the show. I've been mostly absent because I was in New Hampshire so I apologize to anyone that has waited for a new private episode or even email responses from me. You know, I didn't realize the internet would be so sparse <laughs> where I was and that I would have such little time. But I'm back in Georgia now and I'm creating new content and finally catching up on emails. So we're back on track with everything. For those who didn't know I was gone, well, I was. <laughs> if you didn't notice, then I did a good job of keeping things going while in the most rural area of New Hampshire. So thanks, patrons, and if you're not a patron, that's okay, too, because I want to thank you if you've purchased one of my books, workbooks, or used the Amazon link on the website, theoverwhelmedbrain.com. The Amazon link is the easiest way to give back, so if you've been listening for months, years, or decades, use that Amazon link every time you shop. And I want to tell you real quick about the Mean Workbook. If you think you're being manipulated in your relationship then I would highly recommend you get the mean workbook at theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. And uh, if you don't know if you're being manipulated, then you might be feeling a little crazy. You might be feeling like you can't trust yourself. You don't know if you can trust your partner, but they seem to be right about everything and you seem to be wrong about everything. These are just one of the many, many ways they manipulate. So I offer the mean workbook to get the assessment on your relationship. It's very thorough. It provides all kinds of tools and resources and lets you know just how deep in any type of manipulation or emotional abuse you are in. Theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash mean. And finally, I want to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. 
And in closing, I'd like to read an email to you that pretty much speaks for itself. And um, it was based on one of the newsletters I sent out, I don't know, a couple months back, where I said I was, I think I talked about it on the air too, I said I was being conned at a store. Like the salesman was uh, threw in an upcharge at the last minute. And I was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> what's this? And uh, I talked about, you know, the feeling of being conned and also how we... Uh, should stand up and protect ourselves when we feel like we're being conned. And this person wrote and said, I'm just going to read it. Uh, It's been about a year since I've written. I just received your newsletter today about being conned. The topic of manipulation hit a deep emotional nerve for me. Not because of anything that you said, but the topic in general. Over the past few months, I've been speaking my truth and living as authentically as I can. Unfortunately, the results have been a great new me, but a lonely me. Maybe you'll consider talking about this in a future episode. Being manipulated can come in many forms in life. I have learned that life is like a circle of cause, effect, and a repeat of similar experiences. We may make different decisions or go down different paths when a new situation arises. But for the most part, the human experience is pretty much the same, just played out on a different day with different people. The key is how we react to each event in life on an emotional level. How we allow our immediate visceral feelings to dictate our reactions or if we are aware enough to take a deep breath and let logic, reason, and wisdom be our guide. For me, when I feel manipulated or conned in either a work setting or a personal relationship, I immediately start to question myself. Not them, but me. Do I look weak? What makes them think that they can get away with that? Do I look stupid? Am I not aggressive enough? If I stand my ground, will I lose the sale or the deal? Will I lose the relationship or their love? Am I being too judgmental? Am I being too rigid? Although I always make a decision, I loathe the final outcome of being right. Being right in life does not always equate to happiness and contentment. It can result in retaliation at work, losing a loved one, being ostracized, feeling isolated, or labeled as pretentious. Sometimes the question becomes, is this really worth my time and effort? Is standing up for myself or calling out someone for a blatant injustice worth the consequences to me? Do I feel like being a superhero today or an oxygen thief? My attempt at humor. Of course, we are valued and are worth caring about ourselves, but it is not always that simple. Our expectations and the actions of others do not always match. I know this is an extreme summation, but I just wanted to provide another view as to why some of us cave in to others or willfully allow others to deceive us. It is not out of ignorance, but maybe a desire to belong or fit into a community. I can spot a con a mile away, and if I am a mark, I can sense it in the way the other person is behaving or communicating. Of course, The logical answer is to find yourself a new community or people to hang out with. But again, the human experience follows you wherever you go. You can find a con game or a manipulation technique being employed in any economic circle and in any interpersonal environment. At the most basic level, people want to survive and be a part of something. If they believe that doing this or doing that will give them a positive outcome, example, money, a bonus, promotion, sympathy, leniency a date, a sale, or any other human need or want or desire, they'll do it. Unless it goes against their personal values and beliefs. Maybe. (laughs) Desperation can trump values. And if you do not value integrity, you are not moved to take action when someone is acting outside of integrity or being dishonest. I digress. What I was trying to say is that sometimes we do not speak up due to fear of the consequences. Even if we know that we are right, That's a deeper issue and could be related to conditioning. Just a thought, although a long one. All right, I want to thank the person for um, writing that letter. She didn't give me her permission to use her name, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to call her um, Mary. So, Mary, this was a great uh, letter. I'm, I'm so glad you articulated it in such a good way because you're correct. When you approach the world knowing that you're right... And that is a subjective term, I know. But I look at it and I think you look at it in the way 
of knowing that, hey, I'm being conned. I know I'm right, so I need to speak up. Or, hey, I know that person's doing some sort of manipulation on me. I should speak up because that's the right thing to do for me. I'm going to honor myself. I'm going to honor my boundaries. I'm going to uh, protect myself from this manipulation. But you said, you know, as long as you know that you could have a lonely road ahead, that's okay. <laughs> well, you didn't say that. I'm saying that in so many words. Is that, yes, it's great to feel this new me, like you're saying, but uh, it, it also leads to a lonelier place. And I suppose if loneliness is how you look at it, instead of being away from bad elements, then it can look like a bad place to be, a sad place to be. I personally have tested this fear of the consequences thing over and over again. And, you know, when my stepfather shows up and I defy him, before the overwhelmed brain, when I was in a regular job and my boss, you know, said something that was wrong or against me or someone else, and I defied him or her, there was a consequence to that. Uh, when my girlfriend, in any relationship that I've been, uh, said something that I disagreed with or I felt disrespected, I, and defied is not the right word, but I said something in my defense or I stood up and said, oh no, that's not going to happen because you're crossing my boundaries. You're disrespecting me. You need to back off. Knowing in each circumstance that the consequence could be that I lose the person in my life, lose the job in my life, lose something. The fear of the consequence is always a fear of loss of some sort. However, I never saw it as loss. I always saw it as something that I'm gaining in myself. If I stand up to this person, then I have developed the ability to carry myself in a way where others won't try it. Now that's reaching a little bit, uh, but in my life I've noticed that the more I stand up for myself and the more I honor myself, the less people that come into my life that do these things. And that's a vital part of this formula. If you continue to uh, stand up for what's right for you, if you continue to walk around empowered instead of people taking your power away, then you carry yourself differently. You notice people differently. You are friends with different types of people. People want to be friends with you. Like I said in one of my episodes, the day I stood up to my boss, it was like 2009, 2010, it was a group of about 20 of us sitting in a circle of chairs, and I, he was really coming down hard on us for not making enough sales for his company or something. I mean, we're all working our butts off trying to bring in the income and uh, do whatever we could. And when he was pointing at someone and really coming down hard on them and saying, what are you doing to make sales? And what are you doing? And he was pointing these people. And he finally, uh, he went around the room and he came to me. And he said, what are you doing to make sales? And I told him what I was doing. And when he said, why will you do that? And I said, so you'll stop yelling at us, which was <laughs> a huge defiance. And the room got silent. And he just moved on to the next person before, without even addressing it with me. But, um, Later on, so many people, three or four people, I think, came up, that's a lot of people to me, <laughs> came up to me and said, I'm so glad you said that. That's exactly what I was thinking. And that really highlighted exactly what happens when I faced my fears, is that not only am I standing up for myself, I'm standing up for other people, too. I wasn't even trying to stand up for them. I just felt violated. I felt like my boundaries were being violated and I was being disrespected. You know, I did feel it for the rest of the room, too, but I wanted to stand up for myself and I did that. And I guess by proxy, a lot of my coworkers felt like I stood up for them, too. And so I wasn't looking for that type of admiration or whatever it was that they saw in me, but I got it. Because I faced my fear of the consequences. And what does that mean? That means that I could have lost my job that day, which I didn't. But I gained more confidence in myself. 
I gained more courage to take bigger steps in life. I gained the notion that I could actually stand up to an authority figure and survive. <laughs> and I gained that uh, the people that I'm with felt the same way. They felt belittled. They felt disrespected. And, and there was the same fear in them too. So by me standing up, I inadvertently brought some, I don't know, comfort, I, maybe vindication, some sense of uh, someone is actually there for them instead of them feeling so alone. Because that's what you were talking about, right? Not wanting to feel alone. But what happens when you stand up for yourself and you honor yourself is that, yes, you will find that a lot of people end up disappearing from your life. I mean, that could be a lifetime worth of attracting manipulative people or dysfunctional people or people that don't know uh, any other way to communicate so they communicate the only way they know how like you explained or the only way that allows them to keep friends or family they function in ways that are dysfunctional to keep the peace in their life or to keep their comfort in life where i found that the more i communicate in a way that honors me and that feels right to me Yes, the people that don't support me in my path to honor myself will disappear. I will get lonelier. But at the same time, I found that I've also created stronger bonds and friendships with other people that are tired of standing down and giving in. And the friends that I have now are my friends because of the way I chose to be. So yes, you may go through a period where no one wants to be around you. But are those people really healthy for you? I'm not saying you have to do this. This is a journey that not many people want to take. Like yourself, you say, sometimes at the end of the day, is it worth it? Is it worth calling your coworker out? Is it worth saying, hey, you're trying to con me? And then creating some big confrontation and then having to deal with that next and then having to go to work every day and seeing the same person that you called out. To me, it is. To me, my integrity is on the line. My values are on the line. My boundaries that protect me uh, emotionally and even physically are on the line. It's what I choose to do. And if I end up alone, it's because the people I'm with don't have my best interest in mind. They have their best interest in mind and probably a little bit of selfishness too because they probably don't care enough about me to honor me honoring myself. And that's vital. I think when you can honor others honoring themselves, that's a great way for people to connect and communicate. But if you find that you're honoring people that dishonor you, then you end up with the same results and the same types of friends, the same types of relationships over and over and over again. I personally am willing to be alone if there's no one else in the world who will honor me honoring myself. It's not an easy path. It's one I've chosen. It's one I continue to choose. And it works for me. I'm not here to tell you that it works for everyone who ever does it. I'm just saying that when you do it, you feel pretty darn good being in alignment with yourself. And the people that you lose usually get replaced with the people that really want you to be happy. It doesn't mean you go around with a chip on your shoulder. It just means if someone crosses the line, you let them know. And you let them know it's not acceptable to you. If someone dishonors you, you can either stand up or not. There are times when I don't stand up where you're right. It's not worth it because I really don't care about having them in my life. But if it's someone who's going to show up in my life more often than not, then I will stand up and I will say something and I will face the consequences, even if there is a loss involved. And the more I test it, the more I gain. And I want you to always be on that gaining side, not the losing side. So if you feel like you're losing doing this, don't listen to a word I say. <laughs> or listen to some of the stuff that works and discount the other stuff that doesn't work because this is all about experimenting in life. You're experimenting. Does this work? What happens when I try this? What happens when I try that? A lot of people don't experiment because they want to feel comfortable where they are. They don't want to make waves. Uh, it, it's good enough. So let's not um, rock the boat. I rock the boat. That's just the way I operate. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is maybe rock your boat a little bit 
or at least keep an open mind so that you can step into your power and that'll allow you to be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. <laughs>